My name is Akhil Shahani. I'm the managing director of the Shahani Group of Institutions. We run a range of colleges out of Maharashtra and Gujarat. I'm also a angel investor and a venture partner of a private equity fund that invests in education. Sure. So since you are into investment, I would like to know some trends in investment. Uh, what about the family offices? Are they on the rise? Since this is a new concept in India, really it has come uh, from the West. Earlier it uh, used to be investment funds and now it's family offices. Sure. What are the recent trends that you have observed in family offices? Well, I think uh, the family office phenomenon is rising a lot in India. In fact, most uh, high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals, are realizing the value of having a self-contained family office where they actually have people who will not just manage their equity investments and debt investments. They also give them advice on things like succession planning, managing philanthropic activities, purchasing art, purchasing real estate. Uh, something a little more complex than the classic wealth manager from an investment bank would be able to do. Uh, I think also as uh, complexity is increasing in the Indian regulatory space where people have to start looking at taxation and planning like that, it's good to have a full-time person that manages your wealth for you. Right. So do you see it as a healthy uh, trend that is coming up and what are the advantages of having a family office? Well, uh, A, I think uh, running a family office is an expensive proposition, especially if it's a single family office. Uh, so you need to make sure that your wealth is at least, you know, uh, 50 million dollars plus to uh, justify it. Uh, I think the value of having a family office, as I said, there it is able to help you manage your wealth and to grow it a lot more. I th it is a healthy phenomenon. Uh, however, for those who may not necessarily want to uh, manage a complete family office for their own family, they can take part in multi-family offices where they outsource the work to a multi-family office and three or four families sort of work together and outsource this work to uh, a third party. Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, investors tend to follow the herd, and every year there's a new sector that's a hot sector, and then the next year it's not a hot sector anymore. Uh, you should really look at uh, long-term trends. So, for example, like let's say if you look at the larger phenomenon with the Indian market, you know that there are a lot of uh, people moving to the middle class. That means a lot of middle class consumers are coming out. They require a lot better quality education, quality health care, better quality products. So I'm a big believer in the Indian Indian consumer. So if you are looking at anyone in the Indian consumer space, where it comes to education, healthcare, consumer products, or other services, I think that's a great uh, place to be. Right. And uh, since you are also into education sector, I would like to know about this particular sector as well. Uh, it's been it's, it's been a quite a traditional sector. I mean, education has always been in demand. But right. now with technology coming in, a lot of new startups are coming. Right. What are, the, what are some of the changes that you have observed in the education sector with technology connectivity? I think what's happened is that two things. Firstly, is that the education sector today is roughly $101 billion, uh, uh, like in India itself. Uh, what's happened is that with the advent of technology, people who are not traditionally part of uh, the conventional education space, like people who are into smaller towns, smaller villages, couldn't access good quality education, uh, they are able to access education because of distance uh, learning. Secondly, people who are not conventional students, like people who are in the working professions, people who have jobs, people who really can't take off time to get into college, uh, actually are able to then look at corporate training and a lot of the free education options out there. The other value add is that a lot of uh, schools, colleges, tuition classes are now using technology to enhance the quality of education that they provide to their students in classrooms. So it's not just learning from textbooks anymore. You, for school children, you have animations, you have videos and ways to help the student understand better quality. What is happening overall is that as more and more players are coming to the market, the quality of education services are increasing, the reach of education services are increasing, and the upside is that the Indian consumer is now getting a lot more choice, and the value of actually Nestle going abroad to get a good education has come down because people are getting good quality education in India, they see a lot of value, and of course the price is lower here. So people are now looking at good quality colleges and schools in India and working in the Indian market, and there's less focus on getting jobs abroad and uh, education abroad. Exactly, that's great to hear. Right. Uh, now, since you are also an investor, uh, and you, you said you're an angel investor. Correct. And investing in a lot of startups. What are some of the characteristics that you see in the founder and also in the startup while investing? So I'm slightly contrarian. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the classic 22-year-old uh, IIT engineer who just has a great product and let's, uh, you know, it's like 
will be a potential unicorn. I'd rather invest in entrepreneurs who are probably around the age of 35 plus, who've actually worked in the corporate world, who've actually had some scars, or maybe even a failed startup before then, because ultimately growing a business is not a function of the idea or the technology. It's really a function of the ability of the entrepreneur to manage the business, build up a team, and to and pivot as uh, you need to go. So therefore, someone with a certain amount of maturity and understanding of industry would be someone preferable, so someone in their mid-30s. The second thing, of course, is that do I see the technology or the product have a certain uh, unique advantage that prevents other players from coming in. One of the issues with a lot of consumer technology, uh, consumer products, is that the barriers to entry are very low. So let's say if you start, let's say a delivery app, 10 other people can start the same delivery app and then you land up spending more and more money and losing money. I'd rather have a unique uh, technology or unique IP that other people can't copy. And I know that there's a fact that there's a growth potential and it's very difficult for competition to come in. The third thing I'd like to see a lot of uh, hunger in the entrepreneur. Uh, there are a lot of people who run lifestyle businesses which just want to fund, let's say, their next Mercedes or the next uh, penthouse uh, uh, house. But I'm actually looking for people who say, that I want to scale up not just in India, but maybe globally. I see I want to build something that lives beyond me, something that's not a classic Lala family company. It's really something that is scalable. So I look at really the characteristics of the entrepreneur, the IP that uh, they're showing, and the scalability of the business. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.